Good morning. We're going to look at Psalm 23. I'm reading from the NIV. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord for ever. Father, we just ask that you would bless us as we look at your word, strengthen, encourage and motivate us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Psalm 23 was written by the uh, King David, probably the greatest king Israel ever had. But before he was a king, he was also a shepherd boy. And so he draws on his experience during that time to describe who the Lord is. Of course, we appreciate and understand he's speaking of Jesus. But it's fair to say that his experience as a shepherd is very different to what our shepherds perhaps would experience today. So, for example, David would have led his sheep from the front. So shepherds would recognise the the uh, uh, sorry, the sheep would recognise the shepherd's voice. And so in the evenings, what would happen on the plains and on the hills is that different shepherds would gather together for protection and bring their flocks together with them. It was safer in numbers, obviously. Uh, and in the morning, when one shepherd wanted to leave and go off and find his pasture, it would be his voice that the sheep would recognise. And that's how they'd come out from the multitude of other sheep because of his voice. It was a distinctive call to them, and that's how he was able to lead from the front. Now, his, his journey to find the pasture in these fields could take many days. It wasn't like in England where we've got green fields all over. Uh, over in Israel, it was a little bit different, and so the journey would sometimes take a while. Shepherds were warriors, not like our shepherds. Uh, David spoke himself of how whilst he was a shepherd, there's a time he had to kill a lion and another time a bear. I don't think you're going to get that on the hills around Hampshire. The shepherd would carry a rod and a rod was like a metre long weapon. It had an iron piece of iron or metal at the end that would, in order, would enable him to attack any predators that came. And he had a staff. A staff would be a long piece of wood with a hook on the end. And the hook served two purposes. One was to pull the sheep. If they wandered or they fell down a, a little crack, he could lift them out. But secondly, it enabled him to rest on it during his long journeys. Shepherds in David's day were very different to the shepherds of today. They had no dogs, they had no drones overhead, and they had no GPS tracking. It was just a shepherd, his voice, his rod, and his staff amidst many dangers. David's psalm was picked up in later years by some of the Old Testament prophets to describe uh, God's relationship with his people and also how God would describe uh, what was going on in Israel at the time. Two classic passages are Jer Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel 34. If you have a moment to read them, you'll see that some of the comments that God makes are not encouraging because the shepherds, the leaders of the uh, people of Israel, at that time were abusing them. They weren't protecting them. They were being selfish in their attitudes. It wasn't good. Other parts are encouraging. But Ezekiel speaks of how God is so disheartened and cross with the shepherds, the leaders of the people at that time, that God is going to send 
a new shepherd, a good shepherd, and that he himself would shepherd his people. Can you imagine, therefore, many years later, if you were stood in Israel at a time when Jesus was around the area, walking and speaking and teaching, and Jesus arrives and he says these words. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus was declaring, I am the fulfilment of the prophecy, of the promise from God that there would be a shepherd who would come one day and be willing to love God's people and lay down his life for them. So as we look at this psalm, as we, in a sense, race through it, we've got to realise that this is Jesus we're looking at. This is who he is. He is that good shepherd, the one who is prepared and indeed, as we know, looking back, did so lay down his life for you and for I. So let's look at the first verse. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Now, this is a declaration of trust. It's a personal statement from David. The Lord, Jesus, is my shepherd. Therefore, I lack nothing. We know that sheep are defenceless. They have no real weapons to fight with themselves. They have very little skills and they're very easily frightened. And yet David is saying that the Lord, his shepherd, provides all safety and in even provision. Now, if you want to read a book on Psalm 23, uh, that will bless you and amaze you, and I've picked out some points from it. I'm just going to read a, a paragraph from a book entitled The Good Shepherd by Kenneth Bailey. I hope you can see that. Well worth a read. Uh, this is what he says of this opening verse. The Lord is my shepherd, among other things, means I have no police protection. In, the, in those open, trackless spaces, the traveller and his companions are alone. Thieves, wild animals, snakes, sudden blinding dust storms, water shortages, loose rocks and furnace-like heat are all potential threats to any traveller. All of this was affirmed in the 12th century by the Armenian Orthodox tradition through the extensive commentary on the Psalms composed by one of the bishops. He wrote, the Lord is my shepherd. In other words, I wandered in the midst of beasts, dogs and bulls that surround me. Lions opened their mouths and wished to ravish me. I was terrified. And because of fear, I made a treaty with the Saviour. Therefore, do not be afraid, O my soul, for he is my shepherd and I shall not want. The good archbishop knew full well that the opening verse of this psalm is a profound commitment to the Lord as the source of security in the midst of many dangers where no other help is available. Without hesitation, the sheep confidently follow the shepherd, knowing that with him in the lead, all will be well. The rest of the psalm expounds the meaning of this first line. Kenneth Bailey, the Good Shepherd. The point is, it's a personal statement of trust. He is all I need because I trust him. He is my shepherd. But it's not until we choose to put our trust in him, Jesus, as our Lord and Saviour, that he becomes our personal shepherd. You can be in church all your life. You can go through all kinds of religious ceremonies. You can live as good a life as possible. Yet, the Christian life will only begin when we personally recognise the need for a saviour to save us and forgive us 
of our sin. And we respond to that revelation of Jesus by choosing to follow him in making him our Lord and our shepherd. So before we go on, let me ask you, have you made that decision? Is he your shepherd? Do you trust him? For when we do, he will protect, he will guide, he will provide. He is my shepherd. And because of that personal trust in him, I lack nothing. Verse 2, David goes on to say, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Now, as I've said, we know that the sheep are easily frightened. And they only lie down having eaten and feeling safe. And so David is saying, the Lord provides and protects. Jesus does not lead us into any old provision. Green pastures were the very best and they were in short supply and the journey to them may have taken the sheep and the shepherd a few days. Isaiah said in chapter 26, he said, you will keep, speaking of God, you will keep in perfect peace those who mind, whose minds are steadfast because they trust you. You see, it's because we trust him that we can lie down beside quiet waters. We can go to the green pastures and feed well and know peace. Dear friends, don't ever believe that somehow God has got for you a lesser option. That somehow, you know, it's okay for everyone else, but green pasture for me? No, no, mine will just be a little brown or a few, a weed patch. No, that's not your God. He will only ever take us to the best, to the green pastures. I often meet Christians who have this kind of approach as though, oh, I'm not worthy of the best. You know, well, green pastures is fine for others. I'll just make do with the scraps. Look, friends, that's outrageous. That's not what God promises. That's what you've decided to believe. It's not what Jesus promises to do when we trust him and follow him. He makes us lie down by green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters so I know peace and I know provision. The danger is if we've settled for a dull, a boring, an unadventurous Christian life, then the truth is we've wandered from the path that the shepherd had for us and we've settled for a lot less. As I say, sheep only lie down when they feel safe, when they've been well fed, and it's because of the Lord's guidance and his presence that we can do that. His provision and our trust in him is what finds us true peace and contentment. David goes on. In verse 3 he says, He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Now, what he's speaking of here, he refreshes my soul is describing when the shepherd rescues the sheep. The sheep's wandered, it's got into trouble, it's gone down the wrong path, and the shepherd goes after it and finds it and brings it back. That's why his staff was useful. Often people think this means somehow, oh, he cheers me up when I'm feeling a little glum. That's not the case at all. Sheep wander. You and I go astray from God's best plan for us. Isaiah said, we all like sheep have gone astray. Perhaps if I read you a couple of verses from some old hymns some 200 years ago, which actually would be great to sing them again some days. One of them is 
the king of love my shepherd is. This will describe it how uh, they understood all those years ago. One verse says, I'm not going to sing it. Perverse and foolish oft I strayed, but yet in love he sought me, and on his shoulder gently laid, and home rejoicing brought me. And then Isaac Watts set this psalm also to verse in the 18th century. He wrote, he brings my wandering spirit back when I forsake his ways and leads me for his mercy's sake in paths of truth and grace. What David's saying is when we wander, when we fall, when we get distracted by what sparkles, when our life's priorities get wrong, when our circumstances overwhelm us and we divert our gaze from Jesus to our problems, that's when he comes. That's when he comes and draws us back. And David himself knew some classic cases of this happening. King David, in, in the Old Testament, we read of his uh, adulterous affair with a lady called Bathsheba. She was married to another guy. And David had... This, her husband killed during a battle to make sure he was at the front of the fight uh, in order that he could then marry Bathsheba. It was outrageous. He overlooked his son's disobedience because of his favouritism to him. These are just a few, and David made many, many mistakes. But he understood that when he wandered, when he went off the right path that God would have him go. As soon as he repented, as soon as he recognised it and turned and asked for his forgiveness, the shepherd's hook would come and gently bring him back onto the right path. Many years ago, I was on a, when I was working for B&Q, I used to travel a lot and I was just coming back from a conference in Vienna and I knew my life, I was a Christian, I'd been baptised, I knew God, I knew Jesus, uh, but I'd wandered, I'd gotten into a way of life that wasn't honouring of him. I was, had a, lived with a lady and then had a relationship with somebody else, it wasn't good, nothing I'm proud of. But as I sat on this plane, <coughs> reflecting on my life, I just made a cry from the heart. I just said, God, please get me out of this. Or perhaps what I was saying was, God, get me off this path. Guide me to the right path. I, I landed, got home. The lady I was living with said, thanks, but let's call it a day. <coughs> I suddenly had the opportunity and the space to get down. I spent hours just talking to Jesus, repenting. and had some amazing times knowing his presence. It was a beautiful experience and soon after that I met Laurie my wife and actually we got married 13 weeks from the day we first kissed but that's another story the thing is the shepherd is just looking for the sheep to bleat for the sheep to cry out Lord I'm on the wrong path help me and before you know it you will feel that gentle hook drawing you back to himself. Now this verse gives me great hope, not just from my own experience and reading it in, uh, in God's word, but actually many of us know friends and family who did once walk well with Jesus. But now, to be honest, we'd probably say there's little evidence of a daily faith going on. But this verse tells me that if they were genuinely saved, and ultimately only God knows that, Jesus will draw them back to himself. He will bring them back. He will not lose any. Why? Because this verse tells me, but also this verse bases my confidence on the statement that it's for his namesake. In other words, it's his reputation that's at stake. And he promises he will lose none. If you read in Luke 15, the wonderful story about how the good shepherd goes to hunt and search and find the one sheep that's wandered. I can be confident 
because Jesus' reputation is at stake. It's not about me or my worth or what I've done or I haven't done. It's because he's promised and he cannot deny who he is and what he's promised to do. Dear friends, no one is too lost. No one is too far away to feel the shepherd's rod reaching out to them to draw them back when they repent. He rescues and he restores. David goes on to say, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Guys, following Jesus will take us through tough times. We're actually promised to experience suffering, trials and conflicts. These are unavoidable. And personally, looking back in my life, I'd say they are essential and necessary. It's in these valleys when you discover more about yourself that needs to be changed, but also you discover more about Jesus and how faithful and true to his word he is. But what an assurance we have that in those times, he is with us. Let's prepare ourselves for those dark valleys that maybe are coming or indeed you may presently feel you're in in this difficult time. Let's remind ourselves that we walk through the valleys. There are no seats for us to stop. We're going through. That means also there's an exit. Even though you may not see it now, there's an exit to your valley. But most wonderfully is that it's Jesus that we walk with. And that the shepherd was a guy in David's day, certainly not in our day, where nowadays you see pictures of shepherds with a sheep on their arms, somehow like a cute little lamb. No, no. The shepherd of David's day would lift the sheep up and put him on their shoulders and it would be heavy and a burden, but he would carry them. This is what Jesus is saying. In your darkest valley, he's with you with his rod and his staff. Now his rod, as I've said, is a weapon to fight off predators and his staff is the hook to pull us when we stumble or wander and we feel his gentle nudge on us through the dark valley. Dark valleys will come. And as I say, some of you may feel you're in them at present. But let me ask you, who would you choose to have with you in the midst of these times? Who would you take into the valley with you? Friends and family? Your, your wealth? Your health? Well, maybe so they can help in some small degree. But guys, what's important is the incomparable might and majesty and glory of Jesus Christ walks with you through every step of your valley. And he holds his rod, his rod of authority, the rod, his voice, that casts the stars into, into the sky, that sustains the earth, that created everything you see as around us. He is the very one who walks through this valley with you. I tell you, nobody will mess with you when they see who's beside you and, who's, and, and in whom you've placed your trust. Maybe sometimes when we're in our valleys, we need to just stop and remind ourselves who it is beside us. Then David goes on in verse five, he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Tell me, have you ever felt downtrodden, discouraged by the criticism or cruel comments from others because of your love for Jesus? Or have you ever experienced surprise from others that they think, what, well, God would bless you? Who, you? Do you feel kind of worthless? Or as though everybody else is so much better than you, you don't really fit in, wherever you may be. This is what David's referring to. 
And to emphasize the point, what he's doing is he changes the picture, the analogy from shepherd and sheep to a host and their guest. Now, in a culture where your hospitality was the measure of who you are. So in other words, who you are is defined by how generous you are. We see that Jesus goes beyond all norm, goes to outrageous expressions of his affection for his guests through his generous hospitality. He provides a table that is so lavish it overflows before our enemies. And it's Jesus' way of saying, I don't care what other people think of you. I don't even care of what you think of yourself. What matters is what I, Jesus, think of you. And I'm going to demonstrate to you before everybody how much I love you and care for you. Perhaps the best way to illustrate this is to tell you the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, uh, it's in the Gospels, is a Jewish tax collector. Now, tax collectors in the day of Roman occupation of Israel, uh, they were hated because they were Jews, but they used to rob their own people. So the Romans expected a certain, certain amount that the collector would, would get. Uh, but he had the freedom to double that if he wanted and keep the rest for himself. So Jesus is coming to this town and he's like a big celebrity. Lots of people have heard of him and they're gathering and lining the road in order to see him and shout and say hello and welcome him. He is the, the dignitary and all the local village elders and town elders and celebrities are all there because it's important they're seen to be with him and the elders would have wanted to organize everything uh, to tell him where he's going to eat and sleep to tell him who he's going to mix with and do favors to the affluent people of the town and you know by goodwill etc it was a great honor for the host to have him come to their place but Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus but he couldn't find a space Everywhere he tried to push through, people would probably kick him, push him, and even just punch him because they hated him so. So eventually, <clears throat> he goes up a tree, he finds a sycamore tree, and he climbs this tree and he looks through the branches. It's the only safe place he can find to get a glimpse of Jesus. And as Jesus comes down through the town, he stops right in front of this tree. And he looks up and he says to Zacchaeus, I'm going to come and eat with you. And stay with you. Which in this culture to eat with someone was an act of friendship, a, a statement of I want to be your friend, I want to get to know you, etc. Jesus cut through all the culture. The most hated person on that road was the person that Jesus stopped everything for and honoured by saying I'm going to eat with you. And the hatred, if you read the passages, the hatred that was aimed towards Zacchaeus, was instantly diverted to Jesus. Now they were offended because of Jesus' decision. For Jesus to honour Zacchaeus in front of all those who hated him and take their hatred upon himself is what David's describing. In the midst of my enemies, in the midst of those who don't like me, criticise me, in the midst of those who look down on me. Jesus brings you to a lavish table and prepares a feast for you, lavishes goodness and food and wine and oil upon you as a statement to your enemies, to those perhaps who look down on you and says, I don't care what you think. I love this person. Dear friends, if that's if Jesus is your saviour, that's what he does for you. It doesn't matter what other people think, because you know how he feels towards you. And we all have a seat as Christians in that great banquet at the end that the Bible describes. But until then, the Lord continues to demonstrate his favour and lavish his love upon you in the face of critics, in the face of your enemies 
and he is oblivious. He doesn't care what people think. Such is his love for you. David finishes by saying, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When the sheep set out, the shepherd leads from the front, because the sheep don't know the way to the pasture. But as they make the journey and turn around at the end to come back home to their home farm or home base, they know the way back. So the shepherd now now, uh, positions himself at the back in order to protect and make sure all get home. So we can see any wandering, wanderers. What an assurance we have. An assurance that there is a home. An assurance that the eternity that the Bible talks to us about and promises us is guaranteed. Not only just because of what we read, but actually because Jesus himself is following us to make sure we get home to dwell in the house of the Lord forever, to be with him throughout all eternity. And it's his goodness that keeps us on the right path to get us there. It's his goodness that helps us resist temptations and order our priorities well. You see, his goodness is the Holy Spirit, who when we become Christians comes into our heart and transforms us bit by bit. It's why we call ourselves born again. It's that experience of the Holy Spirit coming into our heart and changing us and beginning this process we call sanctification of maturing and changing to be more like Jesus. And Jesus comes and it's his goodness, it's the Holy Spirit's work in us that keeps us on the right path, directs and guides us, nudging us every now and then when we do things or say things that are stupid and wrong, helping us with issues like unforgiveness, unrepented sin, greed and bitterness and similar. And it's his very nature of kindness and gentleness and holiness that surrounds us. And his love follows us home. It's never absent. This isn't a love that is deserved a love that isn't earned, and a love that is never given in small measure. This love is always given in its fullness. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 1, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day (coughs) of Jesus Christ. God's promise to you is if you've received the Holy Spirit, if you've become a Christian, he will get you home. His goodness and love will follow you all the days of your life so that you can dwell in the house of the Lord. And remember, it's for his namesake. It's his reputation. He can do no different. He can do nothing else. He is committed to you to guide you in the right ways and follow you with his love and his goodness every step of your life. Friends, becoming a Christian begins a journey. We travel to good pasture and we travel through dark valleys. There are predators looking to pounce. Sin tries to entice us away. We fall and we stumble at times. We get lost and we drift from his narrow path. And if that wasn't enough, there are people in the world who just don't like us because we're Christians and look down on us. But praise God, we have a shepherd. A shepherd who will lead us. A shepherd who will guide us. A shepherd who provides for us. A shepherd who protects us. A shepherd who brings us true peace. He rescues and restores us. He walks through our dark days with us. Never will his love be missing in our lives. Never is his love given in short measure. His presence helps us stay on the right path in the right way. His voice a reassuring comfort. He has a rod so powerful that no one and nothing can stand 
in his way. And the staff so gentle, none of us can doubt his love for us. What he brings to us along this journey is beyond measure. What others think of us in deserving such, he cares not. It's an amazing journey, an exciting adventure. Following Jesus as our shepherd is a joy and a privilege. And for some, that can be years. And God bless you if you've been a Christian for all those years. But actually, it's not about the length of time. For others, it can be just a matter of months or a brief moment. But the truth is, however long we followed the shepherd, shepherd for, we will all get to the same destination. We will all get to that great banquet. We will all get to live through eternity in the presence of God. And where he's leading us to our true home, it's where pain has no place. Suffering has been silenced and temptation terminated. Whatever you face today, if Jesus Christ is your personal Lord, your personal shepherd, if you've said the Lord is my shepherd, lift your eyes to see your true home to where he's leading you to and look around and see him beside you in all circumstances. But dear friends, if he's not your Lord, if you can't say the Lord is my shepherd, he wants to be so. And he invites you today to make that decision, to follow him and trust him all the days of your life. The Lord is my shepherd, but is he yours? God bless you.